Okay, uh, yes, uh, you said there was a question? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Amitesh, uh, you can ask your question. Hello, hi. Good morning, uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, so uh, actually in yesterday's talk, uh, we, uh, we saw that there is a sort of intermittent transition where you get uh, these turbulent puffs, which are short lived initially, but then they sort of uh, get through the entire flow field. Right. So is there a difference between the type of turbulence that you see in the in these intermittent puffs as compared to the full de fully developed turbulence that you see at the end of transition because the Reynolds number are quite low. And is there some like are there like different characteristics if you say sort of to look at the power spectrum of these two kind of turbulence? That's a great question, really great question, and um, and it, and the answer is they are it is the same. Uh, and how do we know that? So um, I'm going to take time to answer this question because it's such an interesting one. So let me um, let me scoot back through my talk all the way back to my derivation of the Kolmogorov 41 law. Let me, let me get there. Here it is. All right. So, so remember, um, Amitesh, I remember, you, you can see my screen, right? Yes. So remember, remember I derived it, 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 uh, it, it like this. And, um, and, and this, um, this, this, this formula here, uh, in fact, let me let me go back to uh, this uh, uh, th th this this one. So th this formula here is is known as um, Kolmogorov's first similarity hypothesis, and then this formula here is known as Kolmogorov's second similarity hypothesis. So the five thirds law is the famous one, but it really came from this law. Okay. Now, so to answer your question, what you might say is, well, do you see the five thirds law? And the answer is no, you won't, because you have to take the limit as the viscosity goes to zero, which is this asymptotic limit here. And as you correctly pointed out, round about Reynolds number 2000, that's very, very far from fully developed turbulence. And so you can't take that limit. So you can't verify this as the power spectrum, but you can ask, do the data look like this. And so this was worked out uh, and done experimentally by uh, Penaki uh, Chakraborty, who's uh, my former, so, former student and postdoc with me and, and, collab and, collab and collaborator. He, he, he did his PhD at Illinois uh, directly under uh, Gustavo Joyo and is now a faculty member, tenured faculty member at OIST and an experimental, experimental uh, and theoretical lab. And so they, they use laser Doppler velocimetry to look at these, at these puffs. And what they did was they asked, if I take E of K divided by nu squared over eta K, mm. is it a function of this, of K eta K, the, the, this thing here, and does eta K scale with Reynolds number in the, in the way this is predicted here? And so they looked at that and they found that it did. They found that this relation was true and they found that the data collapsed onto the same universal curve that fully developed turbulence does. So from that, we believe that the answer to your question is yes, what the turbulence and the puffs is the sort of rather weak version of, this, of what continues to be, what at high Reynolds numbers is what we think of as these power spectrum of fully developed turbulence. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, very good question. Anyone else got any more questions? And if not, I will go back to my starting slide, which is a long way away. Here we go. Okay, so last, last lecture, what I showed you was that uh, I introduced the concepts of classical turbulence and, 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 and statistical physics reasoning. I showed you then um, nearly halfway through the lecture that uh, we could do simulations to look for uh, the behavior we would expect uh, if the laminar to turbulence transition was a real uh, phase transition or non-equilibrium phase transition. And we found modes that behaved in the, in the way we expected, long wavelength uh, modes. And we found that their behavior uh, was predator-prey-like. And then what I uh, set as the goal was to understand 
uh, what is the universality class of this lambda turbulence transition. And I told you that we believe it's to be directed percolation. And now I want to show you um, how we got that. So last time we described what directed percolation is, particles hop on a lattice. The time direction or the downwards direction, the gravity direction, if you like, is they're always going in that direction, uh, but they can go left or right equally well. And so that's why it's called directed percolation. And I showed you that directed percolation is made up of four different fundamental uh, processes, which are shown, are shown here. And then uh, we looked at directed percolation as a process as you vary the percolation probability. And we saw that at low probability, it didn't get through. High probability, it got through. And at the critical point, it just about gets through. And the way you write down an order parameter for this is you look at long times and you count how many occupied sites there are. And you can see here there is zero. Here there is probably 90% you know, of them occupied. And here a very small number. And in fact, the number of occupied sites scales as p minus the critical p to some exponent beta, which is known to about six decimal places. And there's diverging correlation lengths. Because this system is anisotropic, it has correlation lengths one in the time direction and one in the space direction, the transverse direction. So that you, don't, you have anisotropic scaling. And then what we talked about at the end was we talked about uh, the origin of super exponential scaling in extreme value statistics. And what I want to start off now is to show you, um, given this analogy with, the, with a predator prey system, uh, how you can see that you get um, uh, directed percolation. So what we had in predator prey was the following, A were the predators and B were the prey. And now in this graph, in this slide, I labels the where you are in space. Think of it as being on a lattice, if you will. So these are the basic processes of directed percolation, uh, sorry, of predator-prey dynamics. There's birth of, of prey, uh, there's, there's, there's death. So this is prey plus food gives you two prey. Um, this is predation, a predator plus a prey on a neighboring site, I, IJ, neighboring site, the probability P kills the prey and the predator gets enough energy to make another baby predator on the neighboring site and so on and so forth. This, this, this term here, it tells you that the, the, uh, the prey hops in a number conserving way to a neighboring site with some probability like this and both the predator and prey do that. Okay, so those are the processes. Now near the extinction, which is where the phase transition occurs, the prey population is very small and because of that, the predator population is even smaller. So I'm just going to show you a heuristic argument, but you can make this more precise uh, using, uh, using statistical field theory. So what happens, but the, but the physics is exactly the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to cross out all the reactions involving the prey, the predator, because uh, they're, they're, they're vanishingly small. So we go ahead and do that. And now we look at what are the terms that we have left. And um, the terms that we have left are uh, these ones over here. And you look at these and you can say, well, let's write them down as a, um, in diagrammatic form. And so the, 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 at, at time t and at time t plus one, time t goes to at time t plus one. If you look at each of these terms, b plus e, b plus an empty site, at later times goes to b plus b. So there you are. And then and all of these terms are represented like this. So in fact, the predator prey model then reduces to the four basic processes of directed percolation. So let me, um, let me, I've got a, um, I want to clear the annotation. There we go. And so, and so what do you learn from this is that near the extinction transition, stochastic predator prey dynamics reduces to the four basic processes of directed percolation. So now we, so what I've shown you then is that this predator-prey dynamics actually reduces to uh, directed percolation. And so now we've gone round this loop and demonstrated that the lamina turbulence phase transition is in the universality class of directed percolation. So is it true? Well, let's have a look at experiment. So this is a wonderful experiment done by uh, uh, Björn Hoff. I'm going to just say a little bit about it. So what he, he did was he made a pipe 
that is infinitely long. And how did he do that? Well, what he did was he took two cylinders, an inner cylinder here and an outer cylinder here, so it looks something like this. Um, but this height is very small compared to the circumference, and, and the gap is very small compared to the radius. And so basically what you have is a, is a pipe that wraps around the edge of this cylinder. And then what you do is you let the outer cylinder uh, rotate and the inner cylinder stay stationary. Now, if you work out uh, the stability of that flow, <coughs> what you find is that there is a laminar flow which corresponds to a constant shear going round like this. And that's, that state is linearly stable, just like pipe flow is. But uh, at a sufficiently high uh, Reynolds number, if you hit it or make some disturbance, it will become turbulent. So what they did was they, 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 uh, they um, started off with a flow configuration, which had a little bit of turbulence in it. And the way they measured the turbulence was they put um, a little flakes in the flow and fired laser beams. Well, in this case, you don't even need to fire a laser beam. You just look with reflected light. So the idea is that if the uh, flow is laminar, then the, um, the, the little flakes are, are, are perfectly reflecting. And so the light gets reflected because they're all lined up to form some kind of mirror. On the other hand, if, the, if you have a turbulent patch, then these little flakes will be in random directions. And so the light intensity reflected from them will be dark. So these dark patches here, this is a picture going, going all the way around one rotation and then a second rotation. So, so what, what you do is you let the, the cylinder spin, the fluid spins, you look at this little point, at this, at this um, slit, if you will, through here, you illuminate it, and then you look at the light that you see its intensity and you take this picture. And so you get one rotation, second rotation, third rotation, and so on. And each time the fluid goes round, you see where these turbulent patches are, these dark bands. And what you do is you take these pictures and stack them up one underneath each other like this. And then when you do that, what it produces is the picture shown over here on the right. So what this is showing you is these pictures, these, these pictures taken as snapshots around the circumference of the turbulent, or the rotating turbulent cell, stacked underneath one another. And these, these dark turbulent patches move slightly and they trace out these world lines as shown here. And if you then do this experiment, uh, carefully for different Reynolds numbers, for different rotation speeds. The blue is the turbulent, the yellow is the, uh, is, the, is the laminar. You produce these patterns, and these patterns absolutely look like the patterns of directed percolation. So there's the, there's the patterns of directed percolation, just to show you. So these things really look uh, very similar to that. And then you can go ahead, and for long times, you can measure how many pixels are occupied by the turbulence at long times. And uh, these are the data shown over here. And these data, close to the transition, fit a curve scaling with an exponent uh, 0.276. So what, what, what they've measured, what they've measured is this density here, scaling with not P, but Reynolds number to this exponent beta uh, and, and scaling to with the correct uh, exponent 0.276, which is what you have for directed percolation in one space and one time direction. So that's one piece of evidence that we have that the universality class really is directed percolation. Here's the same uh, picture just shown uh, in, in expanded form. Over here is a simulation that we did of uh, the predator-prey dynamics. So here's a patch of predator and prey, and they are undergoing and dynamics as well, and we've traced out the world lines of, of the predator-prey dynamics. And again, you can see, just as the argument I showed you at the beginning, the graphical argument showed you that indeed these uh, trace out the pictures of uh, directed percolation, and indeed are mathematically uh, in the universality class of directed percolation. If that's not enough, then um, Chantry, Tuckerman, and Barclay uh, did a, a, a wonderful and absolutely huge in both space and time, a numerical simulation of left flow, a particular uh, planar shear flow, which is pretty much something like a channel flow. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but they also were able to measure 
the critical exponents of directed percolation in their simulation. Again, just solving Navier Stokes equations, simulation knows nothing at all about directed percolation or pressure to prey dynamics. So, again, we are con confirming uh, evidence. And then you might ask okay, well, if you can observe directed percolation, can you observe pressure to prey dynamics? And uh, the answer is in, in a pipe flow, uh, uh, Pinaki Chakrabordi, who I mentioned before, um, tried to do this, but it's very, the, the, the mode is a very weak mode. However, in plasma fusion, in, in tokamaks, where you have a toroidal um, a geometry uh, with a, a plasma current going around in this way and, uh, and, a, and a zonal flow just like the one we talked about going around in the azimuthal direction, uh, you also get predator-prey dynamics as predicted many years ago by Pat Diamond and, and colleagues. And these were observed about uh, eight or 10 years or so, 80, 80 years or so, or so ago by this group from Spain, Estrada et al. And, um, and, and these oscillations here are those predator prey oscillations. So you can indeed observe uh, these predator prey oscillations, at least in, in, in this kind of system. You can also see them in, uh, in convection, but I'm not going to show you that. I want to move on to some other topics. So let me just summarize that what we've seen is that the theory predicts that laminar turbulence transition is a non-equilibrium critical point in the universality class of directed percolation. And this has been confirmed uh, in two specific flows in two different dimensions. Um, uh, by experiment and by computation. And there's, there's more things to say about the experiments, but I want to uh, move on to a different topic. So in fact, I'm going to skip this one. I may come back to it later. What I'd like to turn to now is my second uh, course topic, which is fluctuations and dissipation in turbulence. So the, the question that we're now focusing on is the, is the question of how much friction does turbulence generate? And, uh, and what I'm going to show you is a classic experiment that was done back in the, uh, 19, uh, in the 1930s uh, by uh, Nicaragua in Prentel's lab in, in, uh, in Göttingen. And, and, and he did the following experiment. Took a pipe, this is, this is uh, um, the pipe here, and this is what drives the fluid flow. Um, he took sand grains, made them, uh, sieved them and filtered them so they were mono dispersed in all of, all of size 0.8 millimeters in uh, diameter and, um, and then glued them to the sides of his pipe. And then he varied the size of the pipe. So he, what he had then was the ability to send fluid through a pipe, which is rough, and he could vary the magnitude of the roughness compared to the diameter of the pipe. Now, the question you want to ask when you're trying to squirt fluid through a pipe is, what is the pressure drop you need to get the fluid to go through at a particular speed u? So let's call that pressure drop delta p uh, per unit length, and then u is the speed, rho is the fluid density. So we define the dimension as friction factor uh, by this quantity over here. So this is the curve that I showed you uh, yesterday, and now I want to, to say a bit more about it in, 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 de in detail. So let's have a look at the anatomy of this curve. So the first thing is that these are pipes that are varying degrees of roughness. And of course, the friction will increase as the roughness gets you know, more and more rougher. So the pipe, these data at the bottom are for the smoother pipes, and these data at the top are for the larger pipes. And the, the, the ratio of the, of, the, of the roughness to the pipe diameter uh, goes over about uh, one and a half uh, orders of magnitude or so. Okay, so, that, so this is what these, uh, th this is, here is the logarithm of the Reynolds number, and this is the, uh, the, the logarithm of the friction factor. Everything I told you in yesterday's lecture all happened somewhere around here. So this is the transition to turbulence right in the middle there. So this part here is laminar flow. Now let's think about laminar flow. If you have uh, a fluid, which is laminar and, has a, and, and is moving slowly or co-moving slowly with the body, then you expect that the friction will be proportional to how fast you're moving. So the friction will be proportional to the speed u. The friction factor is the pressure drop divided by u squared. So what that means is that the friction factor, this dimension as friction factor in the, in the Stokes drag regime where the friction of the force is 
proportional to the speed, will then go as one over the speed, and since Reynolds number is proportional to the speed, it will go as one over the Reynolds number. So this is the Lamina regime. When you look at this regime, which comes after the transition to turbulence, you see something interesting. First of all, as I, as I go to smoother and smoother pipes, so here's a rough pipe, here's less rough, less rough still, uh, nearly smooth, very smooth and keep going. The smoother the pipe is, the further down this curve you go. And this curve has a slope, which is minus one quarter. So basically you can imagine that if I had an ultimately smooth pipe, this friction factor scaling would go as Reynolds to the minus one quarter. And that's the law that was conjectured by Blasius uh, in 1911. Then what happens to these curves is there's this non-monotonic parts like this, and then eventually the friction factor uh, uh, becomes independent of Reynolds number. And it's independent of Reynolds number, but it then of course does depend on how rough you are. And if you look at uh, how these asymptotes vary with roughness, what you find is that it goes like the roughness divided by the pipe diameter to the one third power. Okay, so, so these are the data, lots of scaling laws in these data. So what I want to, what I want to, what I want to talk now about is how we can, what we can understand about turbulence from these data. So I want to go back now and talk, uh, remind you about um, a, a, tip, a, a particular kind of scaling that we see in critical phenomena. I showed you the same diagram yesterday and I want to now tell you something about it that I didn't talk about yesterday. So let's have a look here at two stylized facts that tell you about critical phenomena in a magnet. So this here is the uh, order parameter, the magnetization as a function of temperature when there is zero external field. And what you can see is that above TC, uh, the order parameter is zero, below TC it goes like this. And if I expand this region here and ask how does it approach zero, the answer is it goes as T minus TC to the power of beta. So that's the order parameter scaling exponent as T tends to TC. Then you can do another thing. You can say, well, let's now uh, ask uh, what happens when I look in the external magnetic field temperature plane, what this picture shows you is what happens as you go down here at zero external field. But what happens if the external field is not zero? Well, here is the critical point, which I've circled over here, and you might ask the following question. If I'm, say, up here where my laser pointer is, if I were to apply an external magnetic field to a magnet at this temperature, say somewhere over here, what we know is what, what would happen is that the spins would line up with that external magnetic field. And so you would induce a magnetization that's proportional to the external magnetic field. That's called Curie's law. And you, learn, you, you all know this law. Now, what happens when you go to the critical point? When you go to this critical point right over here, what it turns out to be the case is that that scaling law, M being proportional to the external field, linear response theory, breaks down. In fact, N goes as H to an exponent, which we traditionally write as one over delta. And this is true exactly at TC. So what happens is then on the critical isotherm, one of the fundamental tenets of statistical mechanics, linear response theory, um, basically has no regime of validity. It, it literally breaks down at the critical point. So these two stylized facts can be combined into one single uh, similarity formula. And this was discovered by Widdham in, in, in 1965. Um, and, and this is called Widdham scaling. So here, this t to the beta is this beta here. Little t is the, the relative, the reduced temperature. The h is the uh, external magnetic field normalized by KTC. And delta is some exponent called the gap exponent. And this function fm is a, is a scaling function, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll say something more about that in just a minute. So Widdham pointed out that both of these stylized facts come from here, and I want to show you how that works. So here's the question. So this is the scaling form for the magnetization. It should be a function of two variables, the reduced temperature and the external magnetic field. But according to Widdham scaling, near the critical point, it actually is a function of just one variable, this composite variable, times a factor of t to the beta. 
So let's see how this, uh, how this comes about. So let's ask about the properties of this scaling function. So the, uh, let's call the argument of the scaling function uh, Z, Z, whatever you want. So what do we know about this? Well, if we were to sit at uh, Z is equal to zero, that means the external magnetic field is equal to zero. And so if the external magnetic field is equal to zero, but the temperature is not equal to TC, then the argument of the scaling function is equal to zero, and the magnetization should scale as T to the beta, which is indeed uh, one of these, which is indeed this stylized fact over here. So what, we, what that means is that the scaling function as a function of its argument should be a constant when Z is equal to zero. Now you might ask, well, what happens when I have H non-zero and the um, and the temperature uh, now is going to is going to zero. It, the reduced temperature is going to zero. So when we do when we do that, well, what's happening here is I've got a T going to zero outside and a T going to zero inside. And the only way that we can get a result that scales like h to the power one over delta is if this t dependence outside and this t dependence inside the function cancel out. The only way that can happen is if for large values of its argument, the scaling function behaves like z to the power one over delta. Because if that's true, if, if the scaling function for large values of its argument, remember h is non-zero, but t is going to zero, and so therefore h over t to the delta, if delta is positive, is going towards uh, infinity. So, the, so then we know the result has to go as h to the one over delta, so therefore the scaling function has to have a functional form of its arguments to the power one over delta, so that this h becomes uh, h to the one over delta. Well, that has to happen, but we also need that the t dependence cancels out. So if the scaling function is scaling as, as z to the power one over, one over little delta, the t dependence is going to be one over t to the power big delta uh, divided by little delta. So what that means is if the t dependence is going to cancel out, then beta minus capital delta over little delta must be equal to zero. And that means then that delta is in fact not a new exponent at all, but is just equal to uh, the, the product of these two critical exponents. Okay, so that's, that's true. That's all very nice. Um, this, this data collapse formula also connects the scaling of correlations with the thermodynamics of the critical point. I'm not going to go into great detail about this because I don't have time, but it's described in, my, in my, my book if you're interested. So here we're talking about the thermodynamics of the critical point the magnetization and, and, and so on, which are derivatives of the free energy. But it turns out that this exponent delta also is related to the scaling of uh, spatial correlations. And so this formula connects the scaling of correlations with the thermodynamics of the critical point. And in fact, all of critical phenomena is, arises from an interplay between the scaling of correlations and the thermodynamics of the critical point. So let's see how this works, how well this works. So this formula says, if I take m divided by t to the beta, and I plot h divided by t to the beta delta, if I know what those exponents are, then all the data, I'm sorry, then all the data should fall onto one universal curve, which is the function f. Bless <laughs> you. Maybe you won't want to mute your microphone. So let's see if that's true. So this is the scaled uh, microphone, and this is the uh, scaled uh, temperature. And you can see that here are data of five different magnetic materials, and they're plotted in the way that I just showed you. And all those data points for different external magnetic fields and different temperatures, so the magnetization is ostensibly a function of two variables, all those data fall onto one curve, and it's the same curve for all these materials. Okay, that's fantastic. Now this solid line here is the prediction from the normalization group theory, and without any adjustable parameters, it goes through these data. So this is called a data collapse, and, it, and this is a much more powerful, in my view, uh, demonstration of universality at a critical point than just looking for power laws. 
because you have to get all these data to collapse onto a whole function rather than just a straight line on the log log plot or something like that. So this is data collapse. So let's now review what I've just told you. So what I've told you is that critical phenomena has two kinds of uh, scalings. One is that spatial correlations uh, scale, and in fact, you, you probably know that spatial correlations, at least in three dimensions, scale uh, as k to the minus two, wave number to the minus two power. I just showed you that the thermodynamics scales with this data collapse formula. Then over here for turbulence, what you have is that the velocity order correlation function, the, the, this power spectrum of the, of the velocity fluctuations, in Kolmogorov theory, scales as k to the minus five thirds. So the question I want to ask then is, what is the analog for turbulence of this large scale thermodynamics data collapse? What goes in this box over here? And I'm going to show you uh, how we can work out what this formula is. So let's draw a, a data dictionary between critical phenomena and turbulence. So in turbulence, sorry, in critical phenomena, you have two types of control that get you to the critical point. One is you have to have the right temperature. The other is you have to have the right external field. In fact, you have to have a zero external field and the temperature has to be Tc, which means the reduced temperature has to go to zero. So that's how you get to the critical point. Now, what is the analog of these things for turbulence? Well, let's think about it. When we reduce the temperature to zero, that increases the range over which you see scaling laws. Now, we talked about the scaling in turbulence as, as being this k to the minus 5 thirds scaling. And I, uh, we saw, and I showed you earlier this lecture, that that scaling uh, gets better and better the higher the Reynolds number is. So then I can say that the analog of t going to zero would be the inverse Reynolds number going to zero. It could even be a power of this, it doesn't matter, but it has to basically go in this direction. What about the field control? So the external magnetic field is something that couples to the order parameter, the magnetization of the spins, and creates magnetization. So then we have to ask in turbulence, what's going to be the analog of an external magnetic field? And the way we have to answer that question is by saying, well, what couples to turbulence and creates turbulence when otherwise none would exist? And the answer is that if I put roughness on the sides of the, of the, of the pipes, as the fluid flows through, the roughness will make the fluid start to, to be twirly and swirly and so on, and you'll get turbulence generated downstream. And the more rough the pipe is, the more turbulence it will generate. And so the roughness, or at least dimensionless, the roughness over the pipe diameter going to zero would be a candidate for the analog of this field control. So these are my two suggestions for what these controls are. So now let's, let's see how we could do a scaling argument based on that. So we have to then ask, well, what is the analog of the two stylized facts that we had for the magnet? And the analog is this, we have two asymptotic limits. In one of them, we saw that as we make the roughness get smaller and smaller, the range of the Blasius scaling got longer and longer and longer. And so you might say that as roughness goes to zero, the friction factor is going to become increasingly close to the Reynolds to the minus one quarter scaling that I showed you. On the other hand, if I go to very large Reynolds numbers, the friction factor is independent of Reynolds number. So that means that as Reynolds goes to infinity, the friction factor goes as roughness to the one third. So these are my two stylized facts. Can we combine them into a unified scaling form? And the answer is, yes, we can. We simply uh, follow exactly the same argument that I showed you on, uh, for the magnetic system. So what you say is the friction factor goes as Reynolds to the one quarter to the same time some function of the roughness times the Reynolds number to some new exponent, just like we did with the, with the magnetic system. And then you do the same argument we did before to work out what this thing has to be. And what you find is this exponent alpha has to be three quarters and the scaling function has to go with z to the one third as z goes to infinity. And if that's true, then what it says is that the friction factor scaling should be Reynolds to the one quarter times a function of the roughness times Reynolds to the three quarters. Okay, so this is the analog of our data collapse scaling law. So does it work? So here, are the, um, here, are, here, are the, here is the data. So 
uh, here are the data, I should say. So this is, uh, so how we test it is we take the friction factor, multiply it by Reynolds to the one quarter, plot against roughness times Reynolds to the three quarters. And if this is true, all these data for different roughnesses and different Reynolds numbers will fall onto a universal curve. And you can see here, I've taken Nikiradze's data and plotted it, and you can see that it does fall onto a universal curve. But it's not a perfect universal curve. It's pretty good. This is clearly better than having, um, having what we saw at the beginning, where you have data like this, that for different roughnesses and different Reynolds numbers fills the plane. So clearly we have collapsed these data, not quite as perfectly as we did in the case of the critical phenomena for a magnet. But you can do better you, because we didn't include intermittency. Now remember last time I showed you the intermittency correction adds in a little exponent eta to the five-thirds law from Konogorov. So then you can ask, as, as, as Marafan and Portolami did a couple of years after my paper came out, um, they, they uh, extended my formula to include that intermittency. And then they asked, what value of eta do I need in order for the data to collapse? And the value that they found was a very small value, about 0.02, which is consistent with other estimates of this intermittency exponent. So you may, you may ask yourself the following question. Uh, why didn't I do this analysis when I wrote this paper? Well, the answer is I did. I did this analysis, but I made a mistake. I got it wrong, okay? It's easy, it's easy to make mistakes, okay? So I got it wrong, and so I couldn't publish it in my paper. And then a couple of years later, Marafan and Portolami did this nice paper, and, um, and, uh, and indeed, I thought it was a very nice paper, and I was the referee. I asked them to in, in, explain as a, as a little paragraph in their paper, the mistake that I'd made in trying to extend my own analysis because it was quite a subtle mistake and, uh, and, and they did that. And, uh, and so this was the, the result. So let's look at, look at what, this, what we've just learned. So here are the original data and these are the data scaled with the idea that turbulence at very large Reynolds numbers, as you put infinite Reynolds numbers, is controlled by a critical point. And this is the data collapse formula that I just showed you. So this is uh, really quite, uh, quite a striking uh, phenomenon. Um, this was only suggested as a result of thinking about turbulence from a statistical mechanics uh, point of view. What's really fantastic about this is that Nikoradze in 1933 was just measuring the pressure drop across a pipe. You can't imagine a, a, a less exalted type of experiment in, in the theory of phase transitions, for example, you're just measuring the pressure drop as fluid flows through a pipe. Doesn't sound very complex, does it? But he measured it so accurately that many years later, 80 years later, we were able to deduce the anomalous intermittency exponents, the scaling exponents of turbulence, the intermittency corrections, from data taken in 1933, eight years before Kolmogorov even wrote down is mean field theory of turbulence. So this is really wonderful. And this friction factor pr produces for you the intermittency corrections, the velocity fluctuations, is a, is a fluctuation dissipation theorem. And why? Because the friction is to do with dissipation and the intermittency is to do with the velocity fluctuations. And so this is a, a link between fluctuations and dissipation. We call it the spectral link in some of our published work but what it really is, is a fluctuation dissipation relation. Not a fluctuation dissipation theorem, that's, that, that's equilibrium, but a fluctuation dissipation relation, telling you it's something slightly different from that. Okay, so you might ask, well, can you actually calculate these exponents, the Blasius scaling and the, and the stricter scaling? And the answer is, you can approximately, although the calculation is a little bit flaky. But let me, let me tell you roughly what the idea is. It's more a, a suggestive calculation than something rigorous, but I, I still have the hope that we could make it rigorous, although we've tried several times and failed. So in its original form, this was due to my colleagues, uh, Gustavo Joya and Pinaki Chakraborty, and our, our papers were published uh, uh, back to back. So uh, what we did, uh, what they did, I should say, is they said, here's the friction factor. It, it's a, um, it's a, it's a stress tensor, 
divided by the, uh, the kinetic energy rho v squared. So what they said was, let's write down the, 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 the stress tensor as the product of the mean RMS velocity v in the streamwise direction down the pipe times the characteristic uh, uh, velocity scale uh, 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 at a scale s, um, which is the main source of dissipation. And what they argued was the following. I'm, I'm really changing their argument a bit because I think the original argument was, isn't really quite correct. But I think I'd say it like this. At intermediate Reynolds numbers, are still in the turbulence regime, the main dissipation is going to come from the flow. And so the scale of this characteristic velocity is going to be set by the Kolmogorov scale. And that scales as Reynolds number to the three quarters. On the other hand, if you have strong turbulence, then the dissipation occurs because the fluid is crashing into the, into the very rough walls. And so uh, the, the, the appropriate scale should be the size of the roughness elements. And so you can say, well, some uh, interpolation formula between these two things uh, would be to say that the scale S is the roughness plus Reynolds number to the three quarters with some coefficients in here. And so if you go ahead and, and do that, then you can argue, ask, well, what should be the characteristic scale of the, of the, of, of the velocity field? And uh, let, me, let me see if I can find it for you. I had it on one of these graphs. Um, sorry about this. I should have checked this form that was there. Bad, bad, don't ever do this in, in your seminar. Okay, uh, gracious me. Yeah, this is what I was looking for, this formula. Sorry about that. So the, the, the energy spectrum is the kinetic energy per unit mass per unit wave number range. In other words, it's d by dk of uk squared, the Fourier component of the velocity field. So if I want to know the velocity field at any scale, what I have to do is integrate e of k uh, dk up to the place where the, the scale that I want it. And so what that gives you is that the, um, the characteristic velocity scale is the square root of the integral of the energy spectrum dk with a lower limit given by this roughness here, this roughness or the uh, dissipation scale. And so this is a, this formula says that the friction, which is dissipation, is determined by the energy spectrum of the, of, of the velocity fluctuations. And we can see that this works because let's suppose you just were very simple minded and plugged in that the energy spectrum is, is the key case to five thirds law. Then that would, that would say um, the friction factor, you can then do this integral uh, exactly. E of k is k to the five thirds, do the integral, plug in the fact that s is equal to that. And what you get is the roughness plus some constant times Reynolds to the three quarters, all to the power one third. So that's an exercise for you to, to just do those integrals and check that you can get this result. And so you can see what happens is that a large Reynolds number, uh, this term uh, is, is going to zero, and the friction factor is indeed scaling as the roughness to the one third power. A small Reynolds number, the friction factor is determined uh, by this term, and, and then this thing raised to the one third gives you the Blasius law. And so, so this, actually, this actually works, even though, um, as, as somebody asked earlier on, uh, in this ra range here, where you are seeing the scaling, um, it's not in that you really don't have a, a real uh, case to five thirds law. So there's something here that we need to uh, fix up and that hasn't been done. Now, how can you test this, this idea? If it's true, it, it, it should be uh, testable. So the best place to test it is in two dimensions. And the reason is this, in three dimensions, the K to the five thirds law scaling is universal. So you can't really get any other result. But in two dimensions, uh, you have two cascades. So let me explain why. So remember what we said was that the idea of turbulence is that the process is Hamiltonian. So if the process is Hamiltonian, you want to ask yourself, well, what are the conserved quantities? And of course, one of them is the energy. 
But in two dimensions, when you've got swirly, whirly things, angular momentum is um, in, in, in two dimensions, rotations commute. And if rotations commute, that means that some of the, there are conserved quantities to do with the vorticity of the flow. And so the most important one of those conserved quantities is the entropy, which is basically the integral of the vorticity squared. So, so what it turns out, and again, I'm not going to have time to, uh, to go into this, is that when you're in two dimensions, uh, you have, in fact, two cascades, one of energy and one of uh, entropy. But it turns out, so entropy is this angular momentum, uh, sorry, this uh, vorticity squared, uh, uh, integral of vorticity squared. So what happens is that when you work out what the energy spectrum looks like for the, for the entropy cascade, it's, it, it goes from large scales to small scales, but because it has different dimensions than energy, uh, the power spectrum goes as k to the minus three. And, and there's also an energy cascade, which goes as k to the minus five thirds, just as we've talked about before. But it turns out that this cascade goes from small scales to large scales. And so it's called an inverse cascade. So sometimes people say, think of the big red spot of Jupiter as the, as the way how if you have a quasi two dimensional flow, you can have, uh, uh, you can have the fluid flowing into uh, creating structures on larger and larger scales. It's not really quite true that analogy, but it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way to think about it. When you go and do the same analysis I showed you before, what you find is that these different cascades, the forward entropy cascade, the inverse energy cascade, have different scaling laws that are predicted by the momentum transfer argument. And uh, it, for, because it's energy, the scaling law in two dimensions for energy is the same as it is in three dimensions. But for this, uh, this uh, vorticity related quantity entropy, the, the, the dimensions work out differently. And what you find is it scales as Reynolds to the minus a half uh, for intermediate Reynolds numbers. And then the large Reynolds numbers, it goes as roughness, not to the one third power, but to the one power. And that's the prediction. And we actually tested it by doing a conformal mapping and, and, and doing simulations of 2D turbulence that way. But we also did it in an experiment. So here's the experiment. How do you take fluids and make them two dimensional? Well, what you do is you take a soap film suspended between uh, nylon wires as shown here. So this is meant to be a soap film and, um, and, and it is, and you can see the apparatus here. The roughness on the side is made by these saw blades. The fluid flows under gravity down like this and the whole thing is encased in a perf perspex shield so that uh, the wind air currents don't uh, make the, 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 the film uh, buckle, the, the, the soap film buckle. And then what you do is you, uh, I think I have a diagram of it, uh, one of these, no, no, no diagram. Uh, what you do is then you fire a laser beam at the, at the light, you put little particles, reflecting particles in the flow. And so what you do is you measure the speed of those particles as they fall from their Doppler shift. And, uh, and from that you can reconstruct the velocity field inside this, this, uh, this thin film. Okay, so you can do that experiment. And, and, and the way we did it was we put in a, a little comb. We took a comb, literally a comb, and poked it through the film. And that makes a grid up here. So you can see the fluid is falling under gravity, goes through the comb, the comb generates turbulence, and now here's all the swirly-whirly eddies that we've talked about before in the fluid. If you measure the energy spectrum for that, you see that that energy spectrum has a, has a slope of minus three. So, we, so this flow configuration is generating something that looks like the entropy cascade. We can also do this experiment. It took us a long time to figure out how to do it, but you can put a grid on one side of the pipe and uh, you don't, uh, sorry, a, 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 a saw blade, a corrugation, no grid. And then if you measure the, um, the spectrum uh, near, near this wall here, what, what you find is that you have a five thirds uh, scaling for the energy spectrum. So you can create both these cascades in 2D soap 
2D soap films. And so now the question is, what is the friction factor in them? So how do you measure the friction factor? Well, what you do is you, is you measure the velocity profile across the film. So the velocity, of course, is zero at the walls and is large in the middle, and you measure the actual profile. And from the slope of the profile at the wall, you can measure the, the frictional stress that the fluid is exerting uh, on, on the wall. And so when you do that, uh, what you find is that the friction factor uh, scales um, with Reynolds number in the following way. In the, in the case where you have the inverse energy cascade, the five thirds power law, you get uh, something scaling as Reynolds to the minus one quarter. If on the other hand, you use the configuration where you have the entropy cascade, the friction factor now scales as Reynolds to the minus one half. So what I've shown you is that the, um, the drag experience at large scales reflects the very nature of the uh, turbulent state at smaller scales. And when I say reflects the nature of the turbulent state, what I mean by that is the following, is that you, uh, what type of turbulence you have tells you how the friction uh, scales. If you just made a purely dimensional argument, you wouldn't get uh, the, the, these results here. So this, the fact that you see this dependence on the energy spectrum for the friction factor, the fact that you see the anomalous ex scaling exponent uh, through data collapse um, through, through, uh, through this analysis shows you that th there's a fluctuation dissipation relation in turbulence, which we can see empirically. We can derive it by semi heuristic and scaling arguments, but we don't have a fundamental understanding of where these things uh, actually come from. So I want to end, I, I began this lecture with um, Richard Feynman um, and uh, the Feynman lectures on physics. So I want to end by uh, showing you um, Feynman's uh, last blackboard. So this is a picture of the blackboard in his office uh, uh, when, when he uh, passed away. And uh, he, he wrote quite a few things here that um, you know, he wanted to do. What I cannot create, I do not understand. Know how to solve every problem that has been solved. And then to learn, and what does he have on his list here? Nonlinear classical hydrodynamics. In other words, uh, fluid turbulence. So, um, so what, have, what, have I, what have I told you? What I've shown you in, this, uh, in today's lecture is that when we're looking at the regime in between, after the laminar turbulent transition and into the fully developed turbulence regime, uh, what, it, what, what we're seeing is that the behavior is really controlled by two critical points, one at infinite Reynolds number, one that controls the critical behavior. Each of these critical points has its own scaling laws, crossovers, and universality classes. And there's in this regime here, we can understand some of the behavior by using these concepts of the fluctuation dissipation relation um, and then things that I've mentioned, but I haven't had time to talk about, uh, the rare events and statistics, extreme value statistics, and mean flow interactions, about which I said something uh, yesterday. So um, what I've shown you in these two lectures is that the tr transition to turbulence is a non-equilibrium phase transition in the universality class of directed percolation. And I've shown you that from a theoretical perspective, I've shown you it from experiments, and I've shown you uh, comp computations. And then I showed you that um, if we want to understand fully developed turbulence or the turbulence at, at these large, uh, large Reynolds numbers, uh, what we can, uh, what thinking about this problem from a statistical mechanics point of view, uh, suggests that there should be new uh, scaling laws. And uh, I've shown you two of them that we came up with. One of them was the Widom scaling, and one of them was the, the, uh, the, the friction factor in, in two dimensions. Both of these things are motivated uh, and derived uh, by uh, statistical mechanics, uh, making connections between the velocity fluctuations at small scales and the large scale uh, dissipation. So these are some of my collaborators on, on the work. And um, let me just quickly uh, point them out to you. Hamid Calais in Bordeaux, uh, the late uh, Walter Goldberg, uh, Gustavo Joya, 
and uh, Pinaki Chakraborty, who is, both of whom are now at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Behind me here is one of the world's biggest uh, soap films where we, we were doing some of these uh, experiments. And this is uh, Huang Yang Chi and Song Ying Chi. Uh, this is us standing in front of the pipe flow experiment that I showed you in cartoon form uh, yesterday. This is the uh, this is Reynolds' his original pipe, and it's on display in a little museum in the basement of the mechanical engineering department at the University of Manchester. Okay, I want to end with a sort of philosophical um, comment because we started off by thinking a little bit about the philosophy of fluid mechanics and statistical mechanics, and I want to end with something about that. So this is a, was a very unusual investigation, at least the, the transition to turbulence one was, um, the one I talked about yesterday, because we, we uh, discovered that there is a, this sort of analog uh, between the turbulence statistical mechanics and predator-prey dynamics in ecology, a, a biological subject. So usually it is the case that we use physics to solve problems in biology. For example, you might make a, a better microscope, like a super resolution microscope, or you might make a, you know, a, a huge you know, million atom simulation of a virus or something like this. So we use physics tools to try to provide better tools for understanding biology. But this was a different problem, because here we used our knowledge of biology to actually solve a problem in physics. In fact, well, Hong Yin Chi, when she was working on this, this problem, actually her, her first work in her PhD thesis was, uh, was on uh, these population dynamics problems in biology, uh, some ecology and evolution and so on. Um, and she was also working on, on turbulence as a, because most of my students work on multiple problems. And what we discovered during the course of her PhD was that actually these two problems were actually the same one. It was a, really a remarkable uh, convergence, uh, something very uh, unique and, and quite, quite wonderful in, in transdisciplinary physics. So this is a fortune cookie and I literally got this fortune cookie. This isn't a joke that I got off the internet or anything like this. I'm the single best person in the world to have received this cookie because it says turbulence is a life force. In other words, there's a connection between turbulence and biology. It says Turbulence is a life force, it is opportunity, let's love turbulence and use it for change. And uh, I fully agree uh, with that sentiment. So here are some of the references for the things that I've talked about. And I think I've uh, ended on time today. And I'll be happy to take any of your questions. Uh, th th thanks, uh, Nigel. So uh, any questions? Uh, I see one in the chat box. Uh, so can you see it, Nigel, or should I read it out? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, let me. Uh, let me. Uh, I don't see the chat box. By it turns off. Let me have a look. Um, in the case of so, the question I can see here is uh, what is the lambda in the two D forward cascade? Right. So it's really just the the rate of flux of um, the, the of vorticity in in this fluid in the same way that. Um, in the K, in the energy spectrum, the coefficient of K to the minus five thirds is the rate at which energy is being transferred to scales. So this is the rate at which uh, vorticity is being uh, sent to different scales. Uh, are there uh, other questions? Uh, yeah, Rama. Uh, can you say a bit more about, you know, this Reynolds number, which in the pipe case is 2050, how special is it and uh, what's the range you can expect in other flows? The Reynolds number, for, for uh, I didn't really hear the question very well. The transition, which, you know, like you said, is approximately 2000. Yes, yeah. Uh, you mean what is it and uh, what, what will it be, uh, what will its range be in other flows? Oh, um, it, 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 is, it, is, it is very geometry dependent. And um, so, so, there isn't, so there isn't really, it's not, it's not something it's uh, really easy to predict. Um, 
I mean, you can you can do numerical simulations and just measure it, but um, it, it, because it doesn't arise from an instability uh, like a linear instability, it's not, you can't predict it. So if you if you're looking at so let me let's clarify what I mean. Suppose I was looking at a Rayleigh Bernard convection, and I wanted to know when does the um, so in Rayleigh Bernard convection I have a, a hot plate at the bottom, a cold plate at the top. Uh, the fluid uh, will rise, and depending on the temperature gradient, if the temperature gradient isn't too big, I will just simply get heat conduction between the top plate and bottom plate. If, on the other hand, the Reynolds, the, if the, the temperature difference is, is, is large enough, then actually the fluid will start to, to, to go into motion and you'll get convection rolls are forming. And that transition is a supercritical transition. And so by linear stability analysis, you can predict the point at which that thing will, uh, that transition will occur, the, the, uh, the critical Rayleigh number. Uh, for this subcritical transition, um, where the pipe flow, the lambda state is linearly stable, uh, you can't do that. So different flows have different, different transitional Reynolds numbers. There isn't much I can say about those Reynolds numbers. Yeah, I was just wondering whether there's some logic to the number 2000, but uh, it seems clear yeah. that it's only a computational thing. It's a, it's a, it, it, really, it really is a computational thing. You can, you can relate um, that number to, between different flows. Um, actually, I don't remember how you, how you can do that, but I remember discussing this with Björn Hoff and um, he pointed out there's some kind of rough way to make a correspondence between what is the critical uh, Reynolds number in, in one flow and the critical Reynolds number in another flow, just to show that they were more or less uh, consistent, mm -hmm. but um, they can't be really predicted. There's nothing special that we can see that happens there. Okay. Remember that in, in phase transitions, the, um, the critical temperature, if you like, or the critical Reynolds number or whatever, is not a universal quantity. Right. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, Rita Brutha. Yeah, uh, thanks. So, uh, so my question is regarding the uh, intermittency exponent. So uh, you showed your work in 2006 and uh, followed by a different group. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the names uh, of the people. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. So uh, the so intermittency exponents seem to be uh, the key there. So can you just explain or um, elaborate on uh, how in important or how uh, theoretically predictable this intermittency exponent is, and is it only or is it just by empirical evidence or uh, how universal that intermittency exponent itself is? Um, yeah. Sure. Um, so. It, it is so. So in, in this, so so what you do when when you're trying to do data collapse, um, you know, even just in regular critical phenomena like this one, what you what you might do is you would say, I know these data should scale, but I don't know what the the critical exponents are. I don't know, let's say, what delta is. So you just try different values of delta until the data all collapse onto the universal curve and, and they collapse the best that, that they can do. And that's how you can measure delta in, in the lab. So this, this, is, this is better than reading off the, the slope on a, on a log log plot because you're trying to fit an entire function. So what, uh, what they did here is they varied eta and they, they plotted, you know, tried to do you know, a least squares uh, error estimate and saw what value of eta minimized the residual error. And that's how they determined this. So, so, so now, how do you calculate the, the anomalous dimensions in, in turbulence? Well, we don't know how to calculate them from first principles. The, the, um, it, it, it's, you know, we all believe that these, are, what I've shown you and, and, and other things I haven't shown you, there's lots of scaling laws in turbulence. So we all believe that the normalization group theory and statistical mechanics should it be able to do something here. But as I've shown you, there's no small parameter that you can use to calculate these things. So we don't have a good understanding of how to calculate this. Now, the only exception to that is, is, the, is, is a model 
of uh, advection called the uh, the uh, the creation of more. So this is passive scalar advection. So the idea is, I want to ask how if I have a fluid that is turbulent, um, how does heat get transported in that fluid? So the way you'd write that down is you'd write down the temperature, uh, the, the uh, diffusion equation for temperature, but you would then add a advection, which means V dot grad T term in the time derivative, just like we had in the Navier-Stokes equation. So that, that velocity field is then coupled, is, is then uh, in principle obeys the Navier-Stokes equations. Suppose you say that that velocity field doesn't obey the Navier-Stokes equations, it's something complicated, let's make it simple, and just say it's some random velocity field. So that's called the creation model. So that model, uh, it turns out um, about 20 years or so ago, that model, it was, it was, it was figured out um, by Goretzky and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Kupiainen and others how to, um, how, to, how to use perturbative renormalization group to calculate anomalous scale exponents in, in, in that problem. So that's the only example uh, I can think of where, where, where one knows how to do that. For real turbulence, we, we, we don't know how to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Hello. Sir, is it audible? Uh, can you speak a bit louder? Hello, sir. Is it audible? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, uh, sir, we know that in three D turbulence, so there is a forward energy cascading from large scales to the smaller scales, because we are injecting at the large scale and there is a dissipation at the small scales. Yes, that right. is fine. So, but what about in case of two D turbulence? Uh, because does it really exist? Like how how it is going to inversely cascading, and what on which parameters it depends? Like inverse. Right, so, so what you have to imagine is if I've got a fluid, I have a scale at which I inject uh, um, energy into the flow or some disturbance. What will happen is I will have two simultaneous cascades, one to small scales and one to large scales. So the, the cone is the mechanism by which you, you find a, you inject um, energy at some particular scale. So then we are not injecting at the larger scales, we are injecting at some intermediate scale? Yes, yes. So suppose if you are injecting at the larger scale, what, what will happen? Like if there is no inverse energy cascade, there will be only a forward uh, entropy cascading. Yes, in, in, prin in principle, but it does depend on, on, you know, on what your geometry is. For example, suppose you think of the Earth's atmosphere as a quasi two dimensional thin flow. It's thin compared, say, to the radius of the Earth, right? And I've got the topography that is exciting you know, fluid motions and so on. And then there's the rotation of, of the Earth. So you might say, well, here's a quasi two dimensional fluid. Uh, energy is being injected at, say, the scale of, I don't know, mountain ranges or something like this. And so um, I should get energy flowing in, in, in both directions. And indeed, that is what happens except that there's a real puzzle because the energy flows in the wrong directions. Um, so, so you see the, the, the inverse cascade and the forward cascade, but the length scales over which they apply are not the length scales where you would expect them to be going. In other words, you would expect the forward cascade to be, um, to, to, be, to be going to smaller scales and the inverse cascade to larger scales, but you see it the other way around in the, in the actual energy spectrum. And so what happens in, in that particular case, the energy is being put in and the way that mean flows are being generated is somehow changing the structure of the energy spectrum. So I, so I, I, I sort of answered your question and I told you something else that you didn't ask. Um, do you want to follow up or is there something, or do I answer your question? Yeah. Hello, so Hydro is not uh, clearly, it's not oh. a proper, so I can't able to hear you, it's proper. My network connection is maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a question in the chat box by Arnab Saha. Uh, 
uh, somebody's raising their, raising their hand. Some, um, uh, Amitesh, yeah. Hello, hi, uh, hi, Professor. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, in this uh, intermittency and rough pipe turbulence, so you have uh, so the roughness factor is indeed connected to your dissipation, turbulent kinetic energy dissipation, right? Now, th that tur turbulent kinetic energy dissipation has this multifactorial characteristics, which is also tied to the intermittency exponent that you spoke about, but. Right. Have people tried with those uh, kind of multifactorial spectrum of uh, dissipation being connected to say the uh, some sort of uh, say the fric uh, friction factor and how does yeah. it scale? Those kind of things have been studied or looked no, at? No, they, they haven't, and they should be. Um, I I've wondered about exactly the, this question, but I don't really know. I don't know how to make that question a, a, a good and precise one because I think, you know, what, what you're seeing on the slide here is as much as you're going to be able to get out of the data. So, so I, I don't really know the answer to your question. I think it's a it's a good question for you to think about because I agree with you. We know that, we, that really the turbulence is not just is is multifactorial, and uh, so yeah, it, it should be. That, sh that should somehow play into this picture. It obviously has to be more complicated than what I've shown you, but I don't know the answer to the question. Thank you. Uh, ben, ben. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. So just a thought came by. So uh, can you please comment on uh, turbulence in uh, space-time or uh, turbulence in string theory? Like multidimensionally, we uh, go in uh, that term. I didn't hear the last word you said. So I, I say he said he's a like, turbulent string theory. Yeah. So, uh, so like it uh, at the moment. So we discussed that uh, okay, string theory is in eleven dimensions. So uh, can we relate turbulence to that thing? Um, I don't. I don't really. I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I've seen string theory attempts to try to understand turbulence. And indeed, uh, Polyakov tried to do this back in the 90s with the conformal uh, turbulence in 2D. Um, I, I haven't seen any, any papers that I found very um, compelling or related to experiments, so I don't really have a good answer to your, to your question. Um, did, did you have something specific in mind? Um, or were no, you just, just, uh, just uh, like I was just a thought came by. So I just uh, thought of this in case uh, you have read about anything on this. Yeah. I've certainly read about it. But if you, I mean, there, there's, uh, there's a lot of papers um, uh, by um, um, a colleague of mine whose name I'm blanking on at the moment uh, at MIT. Um, uh, uh, Lynn, um, uh, actually, let me just check here. If I can find it. Uh, I, I can't find them quickly, but um, um. Well, this this isn't this isn't the paper that I, I was I was I was thinking of, uh, but but the, but the, there is there is a literature um, on this, and um, uh, certainly Mig, Mig, Migdal uh, has 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 a bunch of recent papers on um, on trying to look at um, loop turbulence, and um, this, these are the papers I, I was looking for. So 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 th there is some work trying to trying to use string theory to, 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 to compute turbulence. Um, the idea being that it's not a critical point, but a conformal point. But um, I, I, I don't know much about that, so, and I haven't really followed it very seriously. Sorry. And uh, so just a, a small follow-up. So, uh, so uh, can we uh, use turbulence in terms, uh, like, uh, for, uh, like, kind of filtering or maybe improving the accuracy of gravitational waves? Or detection. Can we use turbulence to improve it? Um, 
what do you what do you mean by that what what, what do you mean by like, to improve so like uh, so like if we consider like uh, so the space time fabric is a physical entity so uh, like we discussed in a uh, turbulence and fluids or like in normal mm. uh, so like that can we extend that idea to uh, four dimensions and then we can uh, use this in terms of understanding how the uh, the space time fabric like kind of I, yeah i i are you asking um are you asking can can you have turbulence of space time yeah yeah yes yeah actually i i think you, I, i didn't realize you were asking that um i didn't see why you couldn't so there's so there's there's a thing called wave turbulence so wave turbulence is a kind of weak form of turbulence so the idea is you have a bunch of waves say on the surface of a fluid and they uh they can they can scatter and interact and you can work out the um the you know the the the, the, the statistics of, of that and uh, they they actually have a a cascade um and um you can um you you can calculate this the spectrum and um and and so yes um you um you, you know that the wave surface waves do exhibit uh do exhibit turbulence and um and and the um you know and so 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 i don't see why you couldn't have um turbulence or uh, gravitational waves i i i wonder about that but i haven't i haven't tried to work out what the spectrum would be and things like this okay uh, thank you very much thank you so do do you, do you work on do you work on that on, on that on that kind of stuff uh, no no i am an undergraduate student No, well it's a, it's a really it's a really good question um, Thank so you. Uh, one of, one of the people the person who I was thinking of was uh, Hong Liu uh, uh, at MIT so he's done uh, a fair bit of work about thinking about turbulence using um string theory analogies but your question is a uh, is a is a quite a, a more interesting physical one which is the, the turbulence of space time itself So I think that I think that's a good question. I've asked my uh, colleagues here who work on gravitational uh, uh, physics about about this but you know it's it's so hard to even detect gravitational waves let alone look at their interactions. But I think it's an interesting question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Uh Pragya. Yeah, hi Nigel. This is Pragya here. Uh, Hello. Yeah, hi. uh nice hearing you uh, like this mm, my question is like are we ready now to see uh, uh, turbulence at the quantum mechanical level or for example like i'm now going to ask you a very wild question can we understand for example give a this uncertainty regime connect some kind of turbulent uh interpretation like some kind of turbulence going on there and like that's why you cannot understand the physics below uncertainty scales h cross scales that is uh, okay so you, you, so you, so you, so you're trying to ask if i have like the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics is the reason for the uncertainty due to turbulence no. that is is there is a possibility to understand like that so well, like I, that. i think there is and um maybe not quite the way that you're thinking of but i think there is a connection so one of the things that we are exploring about about turbulence is um is is this idea of spontaneous stochasticity so so you so remember at the beginning of this of this uh class i talked about how you can get stochastic behavior from deterministic equations of motion and i just used the example of particles bouncing around in a box and said you, you know, everything's deterministic but still you get statistical mechanics so you, you might ask yourself how is it possible that i can have deterministic equations that have stochastic solutions and they can do that's what turbulence is in fact and um <clears throat> so the way the way we think about this is is the idea of spontaneous stochasticity in the same sense that we think about spontaneous magnetization in ordinary stat map so 
the way we think about spontaneous magnetization is like this. Take a magnet in zero external field, cool it down, and below the critical temperature, the magnet will spontaneously have a magnetization. That's what people say in, in say, textbooks or papers and things like that. Now, it's not really true. What actually you do is this. You take a, 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 a magnetic system, it's in an external magnetic field, and then what you try to do is you try to make the external magnetic field as small as possible. And as you make it as small as possible, you ask, does the material have any remnant magnetization left? And the answer is, if you're above the critical temperature, it doesn't. If you're below the critical temperature and you apply an external magnetic field and the external magnetic field goes zero, in that limit, the material that is a magnet still has a non-zero magnetization, even though the external field is tending towards zero, tending towards zero. Okay. So now you can do a following question. Let's do the same thing with a differential equation. I have a differential equation and I add some noise to it. If, as I add the noise to it, the solutions are going to be stochastic because it's a stochastic differential equation. And now I ask what happens as I make the strength of the noise go to zero. So that's like the analog of making the external magnetic field go to zero. Well, what happens is, is in some equations, what happens is that even as you take that limit, as the noise goes to zero, the deterministic equation still has stochastic solutions to it. And that's called spontaneous stochasticity. So um, the, the suggestion is, well, turbulence exhibits spontaneous stochasticity. Or at least we know that it does under, it, it, that some simple models of turbulence do. We don't know if real turbulence does. But you can also ask, can this spontaneous stochasticity also be the origin of the stochasticity in quantum mechanics? And uh, my, my colleague and, uh, and for former uh, uh, postdoc, uh, Greg Eyring, who's now a very uh, well-known uh, theorist in, 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 in turbulence, and he, he's somebody I collaborate with still. Um, uh, he and, uh, and Theo Drivas, uh, who was at the time his student, they wrote a nice paper uh, trying to uh, look exactly for the connection between the spontaneous stochasticity and uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, I think their paper is, um, is on archive. I can show you it. Uh, okay, so I think there are two questions in the chat box uh, from Arnab and Shiva Kumar. Okay, so, so first of all, first thing, did I answer um, the, the person who asked me about the quantum mechanics? Did I answer your question? Exactly. I was, okay. I was wondering, like, do you think that when the stochasticity follows from a deterministic equation, there has to be some underlying singularity structure there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In, in examples I know, what happens is you have um, a, a finite time singularity, and then after that, uh, the, the, there's no unique solution. There's no unique continuation of the solution. And the, um, and, and so, um, uh, Alexei Melibayev has, uh, has written uh, some papers on this in the last couple of years. So you might want to look up, uh, up, up, those, pa up those papers too. Uh, let, me, let me put that up on the screen for you. So here's an, here's an example um, of, uh, of a paper, um, this one here. So just take a screenshot and you can look these papers up afterwards. So this, so this is something that actually we're working on at the moment. Um, another, another one, the one I wanted to show you is, uh, is, uh, is, is, this, is this paper. So, so I think your question is, uh, tends towards a, a very interesting area and it's an area of research that we're doing in my, in my group. And um, if I wasn't working on COVID-19 all the time right now, I'd be working uh, extensively on this on this problem, I think it's super interesting. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do you get screenshots? Yeah. 
yes yes if, if you didn't get if you didn't if you didn't uh, get, get the papers uh let me know and i can send you an email i can send you I okay. have some questions also, but I'll ask you directly later. I mean, through email. Oh no, no, go, go ahead. Why, why, why you got the microphone? Go ahead with your next question. No, because uh, no, there are detailed questions and not directly connected to the. Like, I wanted to ask you about the appearance of curl forces, position dependent curl forces, which you probably are aware of. Michael Berry has uh, has worked a lot on. Like, yeah. so I was wondering, like, whether you are aware of curl forces. Second question was about. Like, has anybody thought about random matrix theory formulation of turbulence? Because it seems like uh, yeah. when there yeah, are no small parameters, then you should think about random matrix theory approach, not yeah. random yeah. approaches. Yeah, that, 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 that's been done. That, that, was, that was even done really by, um, by to some extent, by, uh, by, uh, by equation. Um, and and, and pe people, have, people, have, people have tried things like that. Um, I don't think I can quickly find you the papers. Maybe, maybe let me just see if I, I, it's possible I can find them. I, I don't have. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have them on my hard drive. Uh, there, there is some. There, there is some work on that, but I, I don't. I don't. I don't know that I. That I'm a. I'm a. I, I really, really think it's. I don't. I don't know. That I think I'm convinced it's a good approach because I think there's a lot of structure in turbulence which is more complicated than just random matrix. Uh, like no, I must must uh, say something here. Like uh, when you make this comment, because nowadays we are working on system dependent random matrices, which are taking actually into account the richness of the system. So mm. it's not the old uh, Wigner Dyson random matrix theory. So now oh, the word random matrix theory is much more generic than just uh, yeah. Zero well, I, I think I, I so uh, I, so I then I, I don't then I don't think I, I have a good answer to to your to your question. Um, um, if you want to correspond about that afterwards, uh, yeah, sure. Feel, yeah. feel, feel feel free to. I, but I don't I don't have any any good insights to um, to. to to, to give you that. It, 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 again, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I, I have some papers that I have in mind that, I, that might be relevant to what you're thinking about, and, and I can send you an email later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Uh, Nigel, so there are three questions in the chat box. Ah, okay. Let me have a look here. Right. Um, So the, this question, when mapping pipe to pipe, how do you get the transition rates? Um, in other words, of, do you mean the tra do you mean how do you map how do you map the transition rates in the credit pre model to what happens in, in, in turbulence? Is that is that what the question is? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, th th those values don't really matter because it, just like in, in regular critical phenomena, the, you know, one, once you flow to the fixed point, what you, whatever rates you think you had uh, you know, don't, 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 uh, don't, don't matter um, because, it, because those fixed point values become universal. So all you need to know is what happens when you get close Excuse me. When you get close to the critical point in the in the predator prey, and that that's determined by some ratios of the of the parameters in the model. So you don't really have to map parameters directly into fluid parameters. So hopefully that answered your question. And uh, Saha, Anab Saha, did you want to? Go go, go ahead uh, if you. Yeah. If can you, if, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, so my, uh, uh, so the, the thing is like that, I, I was thinking that, see, I, I want to set up an experiment, say, with this fly, uh, pipe flow, and uh, uh, from the viewpoint of this uh, predator prey, I'm interested to uh, check whether it is this mapping, how it is valid, or in which regime it is valid, and all these things. So now, in this respect, I want to control the rates, right? So whatever rate, then which 
experimental factors that I am I want to change to change or to fix the rates. So that is what right. is, that this uh, is in more practical sense that if I want to set up an experiment with this thing, yeah. Then uh, so, so I think I think I think it's a, it's a very hard experiment to do because the um, when you when you're near the transition, these modes are very weak. Uh, by, just like if you're near the transition of a magnet. Um, the magnetization is very, very small, so they're very hard to observe. And the, the, the thing is, the thing about them is, of course, even though these modes are weak, um, they contribute to the singularities, which are the critical behavior. So it, it's, it, it's it, I don't think it's very, I don't think in pipe flow turbulence, it, it's very easy to see them. Um, the place where you, where you might be able to, to see these things is in um, in uh, in convection, and uh, and I didn't show you this uh, in my talk, um, but if you if you if you if you the, the best example I know is is is, is a model of two dimensional convection, uh, and there um, what happens is that you literally do get these zonal flow modes going along the plates and you generate and you sweep the turbulence along and you get predator prey oscillations. And, and those have been seen in computer simulations, but those are only in two dimensions. So in 3D, it would be, it, it would be very difficult to do, to do an experiment. You'd have to have the whole apparatus rotating. Um, so in pipe flow, I think it's hard to, to see. And the place where you might be able to see it is in channel flow. And the reason why I say that is because in channel flow, um, you have patches of turbulence which are surrounded by emergent mean flows. And I think they, these have the possibility to interact in a, mean, in, in a, in a uh, predator prey way. So um, um, let me see if I can find. Um, So here, here is a um, so here, here is a picture of something which may may well be a good experiment to to do this in. So this is a this is a channel. These are spots, and what happens is near these spots, you you get the uh, quadrupolar modes here. You can see them here, yeah. these things here, and I, I and this has not been done, but uh, but what I what I wonder is whether there is a, a mean flow turbulence interaction between these uh, these um, mean, these large scale flows and the turbulence that's inside this this patch. So that's something that hasn't been studied experimentally uh, properly. This is this paper is probably, <laughs> probably the most detailed uh, model of that. But th at that time we hadn't done our work on predator of prey, so they didn't. Um, they, they didn't do that measurement. So can I take a screenshot of this uh, paper just to for go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay, done. Thank you. Okay, and then what is the last one from uh, Shiva Kumar? Uh, I, I don't quite understand your experiment, your, your, your question. So you're saying the K to the five thirds applies to force turbulence. Does it also apply to decaying turbulence? Um, do you, so I think the answer is, is yes. Um, but by decaying turbulence, you mean, you know, actually, what, what do you mean? Do you mean turbulence that is dying away in time? Or do you mean dying away in space, away from a grid or something like that? Uh, uh, sir, can I, is it audible? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, it is uh, dying continuously until velocity becomes zero. Right. Um, so you want to know what happens to the energy spectrum as the turbulence dies? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, great question. So some people 
uh, think that the spectrum uh, uh, change stays as k to the five thirds, but the, the range over which it is k to the five thirds changes in time in a particular way, and so kind of a scaling theory for that. Um, um, other people, I don't know. That's that's actually what I would what I thought would happen. I don't know that it actually does. Um, there is a, there is a, a fairly um, large literature on on decaying turbulence and and um, the yeah. What, what are, so here here's here's the here's here's a, an example by my colleague Walter Goldberg looking exactly at the the, um, the spectrum of decaying turbulence in, 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 in a soap form. And so, so in this paper, they, I think what they found again, was that the scale over which the, the, the minus three scaling occurs uh, simply changed. But, but, um, um, yeah, so um, yes, so that, that's, that's, what they, that's what they found. So if you want to take a screenshot, this might be yeah. a Yes, yes, yes. So, so there's an, another another thing related to this, which might, you might find interesting. Um, it's, it's a paper that uh, that, um, that I worked with um, Ross Donnelly and other people um, back in the uh, early or middle nineties. So we looked at decaying turbulence in superfluid helium, and so the idea was that you create the turbulence in superfluid helium by moving a little grid through a pipe of turbulence. And then what we did was we used second sound standing grids to um, measure the, to, to um, track the vorticity. And the idea was that quantum vortex lines uh, will attenuate a second sound. And so we can measure the vorticity of the, the decay of vorticity in the superfluid by looking at okay. the vorticity of uh, of second sound. So I don't know if you, uh, I'm assuming you know what second sound is, uh, if not, ask me. But uh, so what we observed in that was a power law decay, which, uh, which I predicted in a simple argument based on the idea that quantum turbulence uh, is very similar to classical turbulence. And that's actually what, is what we were able to observe. Okay, okay, sir. So I will refer this paper. Sir, and can I ask one more question there? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, in case of 2D turbulence, uh, there is one phenomenology called condensation. Condensation. Uh, the, the, do you mean, do you mean the, in 2D turbulence, you mean the formation of a, of a large vortex? Yeah, yes, yes, that's what, yeah. formation of large vortex. That is what accumulation of kinetic energy. The most of kinetic energy is get accumulated at the largest scale. Yeah. So, uh, is it, uh, that's what, is it for only forced turbulence because we are injecting at the intermediate scale. So, because of inverse cascade, it will go and accumulate at the largest, yes. largest length scales. Okay. But what about its decaying turbulence? Because we are initiating the flow for the decaying just by giving some uh, vorticity, whatever we are giving with some magnitude, we are initiating. So, then it will continuously decay. But uh, how, where it comes the form of condensation in case of decaying turbulence? Will, will it be present there, condensation, uh, that form? Yeah, I don't know the answer. Um, I, I understand what you're asking. You're saying um, if I'm driving turbulence at some intermediate length scale with some driving force that then yes. will drive a condensation and then I turn off the force how does the how does the the condensate of the, the large vortex then break up and decay that's what you're asking yes 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 and I don't know the answer to I, I'm sure somebody's looked at it um, I mean we've looked at the things just in, in the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation where you also have a uh, a bose einstein condensation. Um, so I don't, I don't know the answer. I, I'm sure somebody has looked at it, but I don't know the answer to the question. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If you find out the answer, let me know. <laughs>
Oh yeah, sure, sir. Sure. <laughs> sir, may I know your email? Lady? Some we don't know it. My just 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 Google me, and you'll find my email. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank and you. Thank just, you. It's just Nigel at Illinois.edu. Okay. Sure, sir. If I come to know, I will send you a mail. Well, you don't need to come to Illinois to send me the email. In fact, you can send it wherever where you want to go. So um, I don't see any other questions. I, I just had one uh, question. I mean, so uh, this uh, scaling of the friction with uh, the uh, roughness, I mean, so this r by d to the power uh, one third, right? So, I mean, uh, is this expected to be good for like, uh, I mean, uh, and different Ds or like, is it better for a small D or, I mean, even though it says the ratio it matters, but I mean, uh, in reality, I mean, like in, uh, is this scaling expected to be better at, uh, I guess, at smaller uh, diameter tubes, right? Um, so, so you, you're asking about the scaling. Of the, <clears throat> let, let me go to the slide, and, and maybe maybe that would help. Um, so you're asking about the the scaling uh, here for the for the. Uh, and, and and you're asking, is it does it work better at, at which scale? Uh, right. Yeah. When you uh, when you have large diameter tubes, or at like uh, I mean, like if I take a, a huge diameter and just change the. Uh, the right. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, what well, what they did in the experiment was they varied the ratio of the size of the uh, the, the roughness elements, the sand grains, to the diameter of the pipe. So they actually did different diameter pipes. And different sand grains in order to vary this ratio over over from about what is that fifteen to twelve or something to something like five hundred. So so I think I think what's really important is the ratio, not not the actual value of the diameter. Yeah. So you're saying it's just that like it should work at uh, I mean like the large. Yeah, it, it, it works very well. I don't have the okay. Uh, I, in these slides, I, I didn't put in the. Let me see. Maybe I have it hidden. I don't think I put in the the, the data for it. I, I, I have a, I have a slide which does have the data, um, but I, I don't think I, I put it in this in, in these in these lectures. It, it works pretty well. Um, I, I don't I don't think I, I don't know of any systematic study to see. You know, does it break down at small or large roughnesses or anything like that? Okay. I think if you look in the original, by the way, this experiment, the one I'm, the one I'm showcasing here, you might say, why, why am I looking at this experiment from the 1930s? Why don't I look at a more, you know, more modern experiment? Well, this experiment has never been repeated, even though I've tried to get people to repeat it. Um, well, it's, a, it's a difficult experiment to do, and the, the, what, what, if, if somebody could repeat it, what I would want them to do is, is to also measure the energy spectrum at the same time as they measure the friction factor. But, uh, but at the time that Nicaragua did this experiment, they didn't even they weren't even thinking about energy spectrum, so they, they didn't think of doing that. In any case, their pipes were too small, so. Um, you know, that, that, that's a question that really needs to be figured out. But today, for anybody to do these experiments and take very smooth pipes and then systematically make them rougher and rougher and rougher, uh, nobody, wants to, nobody wants to do that. Okay. But uh, it's not like, I mean, uh, since he did it 100 years back, it's, it's not a very difficult experiment to do, right? I mean, why is it? I, I, I didn't. We we tried to rep we tried to, with one of the students at Illinois so maybe ten years or so ago we we tried to replicate some aspect of this experiment and try to try to measure simultaneously spectra and and, and friction using using air as a fluid uh, it wasn't 
a great success. We, we got, we, there were some results, but, um, but, but nothing of this quality. So um, I don't think it, I, I agree. I don't think it would be, you know, it's easy for me to say it, it's not hard to do. You know, any experiment you suggest is going to take, spend, take five years of somebody's life. <laughs> so um, I've talked about it with Bjorn Hoff, who, is, who I collaborate with on transition to turbulence. I mean, we're certainly aware of the interest in this, um, but uh, so far nobody, nobody really sat down to, to do this. Uh, so I think uh, 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 maybe it's a good time to stop. Uh, so uh, th thanks again really for this uh, really fascinating and uh, insightful talk and uh, I really appreciate uh, like, uh, that you took this uh, I mean, time from your really busy schedule and uh, I mean, wish you all the best in the, in the uh, modeling front and uh, hope things get better soon. Uh, so, and uh, hope to see you in Bangalore uh, uh, soon. <laughs> yes, yeah, you too. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, thanks again. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Prakya. Bye. 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 Bye.